So I think we can begin. Uh, welcome to the sixth KSB webinar. And today we are delighted to have Dr. Badri Kopala Krishnan, um, who is an economist at McKinsey, an Asian Development Bank. He's a fellow at University of Purdue. He is also working on research projects with the University of Harvard and London School of Economics and Purdue. Um, and he has, he's the author of a recent report for Asian Development Bank, which assesses the impact of COVID-19 on the global economy. Dr. Badri, Badri is based in Seattle. Uh, Dr. Badri, thank you so much for taking your time for this call. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ali. Uh, really, my privilege to be part of this call. I mean, it's, it's a pleasure. And I was before we um, um, we reconnected on this call, I was saying to Badri that we met 16 years ago at the Nobel Laureates Conference in Lindau, and where he was uh, representing India, and I was selected to attend from Pakistan. And um, and we were pri privileged to have interact with uh, Nobel Laureates um, in economics um, at that beautiful city. So Badri, it's great yeah. to reconnect and thank you for taking your time for this call. And most of the audience uh, are um, based in Pakistan. Um, so you are based in Seattle, I am based in London and most of the audience in, in Pakistan. So we have a range of uh, time zones um, here. And I think there's almost a 12 hours difference between where you are and um, people in Pakistan. Um, I'll, the format of this call, like our previous calls would be that um, I will hand it over to you to talk about your report and how do you see COVID impacting the global economy. And um, then after 15, 20 minutes, we'll do, I'll, I'll kick off with some questions and then we'll open it up for Q&A for the wider, wider audience. Is that good? Yeah. That's, that's perfect. Uh, you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. It was uh, wonderful uh, reconnecting, like you said, after many years and, um, and, and I'm happy to be part of this uh, webinar. Uh, so I will. Uh, so I'm, I recently completed this report, which was shared with all of you with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, this is something we started working in uh, February, and uh, the situation was totally different when we started the project. And at that point, we were thinking of this as uh, a supply chain disruption happening in China, and not affecting. I mean, other countries are affected only through the global supply chain. And uh, and that's how they 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 did a previous uh, Asian Development Outlook policy brief, in in which they actually had um, that kind of assumption. Basically, what what is the impact on the global economy of China's uh, domestic uh, you know supply chains? Uh, and while we were working on this uh, uh, project uh, in the past uh, two three months. We, it took about two, more than two months to finish this. Uh, every day we were updating what is happening. Um, and um, and um, finally, we ended up in a situation where almost the entire world has been affected directly in terms of shutdown and so on. So that is a backdrop of this uh, you know, report, how we started and how we ended up finally. Uh, in terms of the... Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll spend uh, like maybe two, three minutes to explain how we did it, what, what, what kind of modeling did we do and so on. So we uh, employ um, a, a model called the Global Trade Analysis Project model, GTAP. Uh, this is a model that is developed at Purdue University where uh, I used to previously work and lead this uh, development of this model. And this model is a quantitative economic model which captures the supply chain linkages, global supply chain linkages, how, um, you know, things happening in one industry in one country can affect uh, other industries in other countries. So all this intersectoral and inter-country uh, linkages are captured well in this uh, framework. Uh, and, uh, and this is an ideal framework for the kind of crisis that we're going through, how to, how to make sense of what is happening. And it is a what if uh, kind of model. So you can basically think of different scenarios and feed that in. So coming back to our work, what we did using this model, is to think of two different uh, high-level scenarios. Uh, one scenario is uh, that the ongoing crisis stays for uh, around three months. Uh, basically, by June, July, we are we are out of it. Um, and uh, and another scenario which is more probably realistic or or maybe pessimistic, depending on uh, you know what what is your take on this issue. And that scenario, we assume that. 
a containment is going to be longer, uh, maybe six more months. So something like December, January is when the normalcy will be restored. Um, so we have we went on with these two assumptions, two alternative scenarios. We could have also gone with more negative scenarios, uh, uh, but we thought we will just, you know, keep this as the benchmark, and then and then we can always, you know, discuss uh, verbally on how could it be if it becomes even worse than this. So on this, we had uh, five five different um, you know, aspects that we considered for. Uh, for this, uh, uh, you know, for modeling, the first thing is um, the tourism is, you know, pretty much uh, gone all over the world, and how how would that affect uh, the the economies? Uh, so that is the first thing. So particularly the tourism intensive countries will take a greater hit because of this, uh, you know, this reason. Uh, second thing is uh, there is a simultaneous uh, disruption happening in the supply chain and demand. Uh, demand is falling, and the uh, and the uh, like earlier the the first shock, as I told you in February, was reduction in supply uh, because of our extreme dependence on Chinese markets, um, and then later uh, that led to demand reduction because companies are laying off and you know employment was going down, income was going down, so demand is falling, and then later on it's basically people are staying home. In addition to the income losses, even the people who are earning well, they are staying home and not spending, so demand is falling. So there is a simultaneous uh, slump in supply and demand. Uh, some kind of productive capacity is falling and consumption is falling. So that is the second set of things we considered. And the third thing, third set of things is about investment behavior, how people are reducing their investment outlook and you know, it's becoming more negative and people are disinvesting or uh, postponing their new new investment plans uh, all these things and, and and looking at that 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 aspect another aspect is uh, explicit uh, trade measures so people are also working on um, making trade more difficult uh, reducing the um, you know ease of uh, exporting and importing uh, increasing tariffs uh, you know banning exports imports all kinds of measures that have led to uh, trade being affected directly, the global supply chain being direct, affected directly. And the last aspect is the, the positive aspect, which is the stimulus that is being injected across the world by different countries uh, on, on the economies, on the producers and consumers. So these are the different levers that we, uh, you know, uh, you know, thought about. And in terms of uh, our, and, 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 and the data we, we used, we, since I worked with ADB, they had very up-to-date data for all the ADB member countries, and also we strive to get good data for other countries too. Um, so our, uh, based on all these uh, levers that I discussed and based on this analysis, our high level result, the, the overall um, you know, result for the global uh, GDP, uh, global GDP losses was to the tune of uh, $6.8 trillion at the minimum and uh, 9.8.8 .8 trillion dollars at the maximum so both uh, you know two two um, two different uh, you know like we have upper bound and lower bound for this and uh, if we particularly look into asia uh, other than china um, uh, all the other asian countries except china because china is yeah, china has already seen the worst and its effect will be more negative uh, because for other countries, we have only seen some some part of the uh, you know uh, the changes because we are yet to see the yet to see the uh, you know peak of uh, you know the effect um, or or the bottom of the crisis. Um, so so for for the the Asian countries, the reduction uh, has been between uh, 4.6 to 7.2 percent in GDP. Whereas for China, it is like 7.5 to 11%. So China is affected more. And also, uh, as we can see, as we, we all can see from the news and uh, other developments, the, the developing countries in Asia have been relatively less affected uh, in, terms of, in terms of health, actually, in terms of uh, health effects, like number of infections, deaths, and so on. In South Asia, for example, uh, they have been relatively smaller given the size of these countries and and given the general 
um, difficulties in implementing stringent regulations uh, in these countries. So given that, you know, the, the effect has been uh, smaller. Um, and, and whereas for the advanced economies, the developed countries, which usually have uh, a pretty good uh, healthcare system and good resilience systems and so on, and they have actually kind of, uh, ironically, they have got affected much more. Uh, so uh, what our uh, analysis is for the rest of the year, we are not considering the long-term impact. So in this year, uh, these are the you know, changes that are expected. Uh, when we think of uh, sectors, specific sectors, uh, we see that um, large um, you know, impact uh, has been on the retail sector and the recreation sector and, um, and, and also on groceries and pharmaceutical sector uh, because uh, people are um, not taking... Uh, other diseases, people are completely focusing on COVID. So other health conditions are not being uh, addressed to so much because people are worried that if they go to hospital, you know, they'll get, get uh, uh, they'll probably get COVID. Um, so uh, also the transit stations have been affected a lot, uh, all the uh, you know, transits and transportation and, and also workplaces, wherever, whichever industry which needs you to sit in a workplace um, and work work the, those those also have been have been affected so uh, so basically those are those are the main sectors that got affected uh, coming to uh, south asia in particular um, since we we are interested more in this region uh, the overall uh, effect in terms of uh, you know gdp or um, uh, if we uh, if we do not take any policy action the overall uh, reductions are something in the lines of uh, uh, some hundreds of billions of dollars. So $140 billion in the short, if the crisis is short and around $200 billion if the crisis is uh, longer, uh, which is basically around 3.9 to 6% uh, of uh, GDP. Uh, and, uh, and also um, um, another uh, thing, uh, that is happening here is uh, with the policy impact. Once we once we are able to um, uh, take into account the policy measures, basically the fiscal stimulus, uh, then the the impact can be uh, relatively uh, smaller. Uh, it can be reduced by uh, around around uh, half of the uh, half of the negative impact can be washed out. Uh, that's what we see. And in terms of uh, uh, employment, um, uh, again, uh, the, the impact is pretty, pretty big, something like 30 to, 40, 30, 30 to 46 million uh, jobs will be lost in South Asia in particular. And, um, and, and, and that, that, that again, again uh, when, when the um, policy measures like stimulus uh, measures are taken uh, seriously, uh, then, then you can actually, uh, you know, reduce a lot of this impact. So, for uh, in terms of the stimulus packages in South Asia, the stimulus packages have been smaller. In Pakistan, in India, um, and, and uh, India has recently announced a big package, but uh, it, the details aren't very clear, and, and it appears that a large part of it could be liquidity injection. So in general, all these uh, all the South Asian countries have had uh, relatively less uh, fiscal stimulus compared to uh, you know countries like uh, you know UK, USA, uh, even the other EU countries and and, and Japan. Japan has the highest uh, uh, um, you know fiscal stimulus uh, in, in uh, relatively speaking. Uh, I think something around twenty percent of the GDP. Um, so so I think in in, in this context, uh, what what we uh, uh, what I, I can conclude from this analysis is that uh, the the impact uh, has been pretty high, uh, even for the countries that are less affected um, health-wise. The reason being that there is the shutdown and um, you know everything is uh, uh, you know standstill, and the trade is affected a lot. The global uh, supply chains are disrupted a lot. So for all these reasons, both supply side and demand side reasons, uh, things are really bad, even in countries like Pakistan. 
and uh, the the only way out of this crisis is uh, 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 st the proper uh, stimulus packages which can first um, reduce the liquidity issue of the masses the people at large can have some money in their pocket so that they can start spending uh, and secondly the companies that are failing they have to be taken care of uh, and the and the controversy there is oh, should we bail out or should we um, uh, you know leave them alone uh, uh, and in that in that case i think uh, one 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 remedy could be to bail out but then take equity so while bailing out just don't just give free uh, bail out but but do it uh, in a conditional way and with 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 uh, acquiring some of the equities um, and that is one one potential way to go ahead and um, and i think that that's uh, that's where um, we uh, conclude in the report also that um, first of all the stimulus has to be much stronger and larger in the de the developing countries in particular and secondly uh, the healthcare intervention also should be uh, you know, stronger and and, and uh, more effective and also the uh, social dis the physical distancing has to be practiced more uh, you know rigorously uh, even even if we are opening up the economies because what we feel is that um, if if you compare our two scenarios, short containment and longer long containment, uh, you can see that definitely the the impact in the long containment are more than double in some cases. So so it is actually better to endure uh, uh, some severance for a short period of time and fix the problem rather than continuing it, uh, let it linger around for a longer time and that leading to greater damages to the economy uh, so that is one uh, one kind of uh, conclusion we had so stimulus and um, increase in um, uh, increase in healthcare interventions so I, I think with that i'll conclude my short uh, talk and i can take more questions um, thank you for that uh, dr badri there were it was fascinating and there were three points which were very interesting for me um, first as you said that you know when it started out it was mainly considered to be a china trade problem and you pointed out to the report that asian development bank wrote and i remember quoting it in one of my research that you know that report stated that the impact on pakistan will be quite minimal but then as time passed this developed into a bigger greater what imf calls a global lockdown and the impact also became multifaceted and as you pointed out it became a demand problem, a supply problem, an investment behavior and psychological problem as well in terms of how it impacts consumption and human behavior. The second point, which I thought was very interesting, and you alluded to that, when you mentioned that even pharmaceutical sector and the healthcare sector has been suffering, which is very interesting because um, it's not intuitive. Intuitively, I would have thought that um, um, there would have been a greater focus towards those. But you rightly pointed out, and recently a data point came, um, I saw a data point that in the case of Pakistan, um, occupancy in hospital is much lower than normal, because as you pointed out, that people with other ailments are avoiding going to the hospital in order to A, avoid um, catching the infection, or B, even um, uh, they're scared to go out um, uh, with their ailments. So uh, that impact is there, and it's not that clear. And the third point which you mentioned, which is about the stimulus. Um, so, you know, in Pakistan, we have seen almost 525 odd basis points cut in interest rates. And there has been a fiscal stimulus as well of around 2.5% of GDP. But it's much lower than what we have seen, as you said, that in the developed markets, the stimulus sizes have been up to 30% of GDP. While in developing countries, it's that 1% to 3% of GDP. And India stands out because I think initially this announced a similar, you know, smaller fiscal stimulus, but in the last couple of weeks, they have announced that they will take it up to 10% of GDP. So there's, there's a question mark in terms of, um, are the developing countries doing enough? And you are saying that perhaps that's not the case, but they need to do more. But B, of course, you know, a lot of these countries, especially Pakistan, we don't, know, we don't have enough fiscal space uh, to finance that spending, and that has implication on borrowing and the, you know, the debt and um, which of course the very time which is a hot topic right now for Pakistan 
So uh, we have some questions coming. Uh, we have two questions so far, but I'll kick off with the first one. Um, recovery. You know, which camp are you in? V, L, U, you know, what's your view on the recovery? So I, I think like all uh, things that are practical and real, uh, and we, the reality is somewhere, um, uh, it's, it's kind of a combination of this, uh, V, L, and U. Uh, uh, in some sectors, like the sectors that require people coming together and so on, it's probably going to be close to L. Uh, you or, or maybe a, some kind of you know you with the with you, you where, where the you know the the, the up, uppermost part of the the second uh, half is maybe half of the initial part or something like that. So so it's more like more close to L. Uh, and whereas uh, if you take digital economy, uh, I don't even know if um, if if it fell actually. It, it has been uh, you know positive. Uh, and expanding and if you think about um, other industries like food food production like food uh, agriculture food and so on uh, they have been uh, relatively less affected from a demand perspective uh, because obviously you know they're essentials and people don't want to compromise on them and actually since people are not going to restaurants the you know primary agricultural products are more in demand people are buying fresh vegetables and meat and so on so so that that sector is uh, positive. Uh, I mean, the the recovery. Can, the, yeah, it's still there was a fall because of the supply chain disruption, and there they can they can pick up very quickly as soon as the recovery uh, as soon as the crisis is gone. I think we are going to have a V-shaped recovery, and I think we also see uh, in South Asia we have a good monsoon, and uh, it's going to be uh, you know the agricultural sector has had a good good harvest and so on. So I think. That sector is going to be good. Uh, if you take a sector like auto industry, uh, that has been, as you uh, as you would know, uh, all of you would know better than me, it has been falling for some time globally, not only in South Asia, or Pakistan, or India, but globally it has been falling, and uh, and that will continue to happen, partly because it's a sign of prosperity. If if, if people are more prosperous, they're going to buy more cars. And now it is going to be a while before people can become prosperous. And secondly, the tendency of people are, is also changing. Right? People are also, um, uh, you know, going more and more towards sharing economy. And this happened even before, even before COVID happened. The millennials, uh, in many surveys, they are found to be more, more for you know, rented houses, shared cars, all these things. So, so I think that culture has been already there, and now it may become more but if you think about the other other way uh, maybe there could be one one example could be that uh, you know people may not want to uh, take much public transport because uh, particularly the richer people uh, the upper middle class people they may want to have their own private vehicle and maybe the, the design of taxis may change because there will be more isolation between the driver and passenger and uh, probably you may not see the kind of cramped uh, passengers as we did before so I think those are those are some you know uh, you know uh, silver line silver lining kind of things for the auto industry, and similarly I can keep talking about many industries, but I think I would it would probably suffice to say that uh, a large number of industries are going to go through uh, um, U-shaped recovery. Uh, V-shaped I don't see in many. V-shaped maybe probably just in food sec agriculture sector maybe. Um, but yeah, um, U, U can be expected in many sectors. L can be in a bunch of service sectors and, uh, you know, gathering uh, related sectors. And I also want to discuss another topic related to recovery, which is, uh, as you also rightly pointed about the fiscal space problems, uh, particularly in Pakistan, and I've been reading about it, and also uh, other countries uh, as well. Um, I think the way to address this would be, like I mentioned, uh, do not um, link this. Uh, for the government can be prudent in spending the stimulus. They can they can do the stimulus, but they can do more facilitation and equity participating those kind of things rather than just shelling out money because they have limited resources. Um, uh, like like even if you look at uh, India's package. Uh, large large part of the announcements has been reforms, basically. Some of the fundamental reforms that are pending for many decades, they have been going through now. So 
So basically, improving the facilitating environment, enabling environment in the in the in the market, this is the right time to do that. Uh, some bold reforms can be done now because the recovery can be the path of recovery can. Uh, we are almost starting afresh, so the recovery can be in a new policy environment, new business environment, which is which is more friendly and which is uh, overcoming all the challenges we had before. So that is the macro thing I would think of. And at a micro level, I think the industries also should change their strategies. So I think this recovery is not entirely top down. And this recovery is going to be more, more of a bottom up recovery where it is going to depend a lot on how specific industries are going to come up with innovative solutions. Uh, for example, uh, restaurants that can respect physical distancing and that can probably come up with delivery options and so on probably they're only going to prosper. I already see uh, indications for that because people are uh, you know, tired of eating home food, home cooked food, so they want to eat outside food. And if there are enough precautions taken, uh, you know, for example, transparency uh, of you know, what is going in, how, how food is handled and so on. So that is just one example, but I can, I can think of many such examples where the micro level uh, entrepreneurs and small industries, medium, large, all kinds of industries, they have to come up with different, um, maybe retailing strategies, you know, how to reach the customers and also production strategies, how to, uh, I was talking to a manufacturer here in Seattle and uh, he was saying that they have instituted physical distancing norms in their factories and, and they have kept all the workers who can work remotely. They can operate machines from their home um, and, you know, they are, they are working from home and only the workers who need to be physically located they are there and they wear, they all have to wear masks and they have to be socially distanced and so on so these kind of uh, measures uh, have to be taken by the firms and actually the startups and small smes that are entering the market of you know for example producing ppes um, masks and uh, all these kind of things they are going to uh, probably be successful in the longer term because right now they may be doing it for this recovery but eventually they, they can develop capacity in that and and i, I see many of the textile uh, like uh, apparel and textile firms are being converted into mask production firms and so on right so so which i, I agree that there may not be sustained long-term demand for it but but at least they can diversify their production that is the idea so they can they can be more agile and uh, flexible and diversify their production and new technologies can be thought about more and more automation robotics blockchain for understanding the transparency and safety of products uh, all these things have to be uh, you know done and uh, and in terms of uh, again coming back to the macro uh, trade policies i think there is a lot of tendencies across the world to be more closed less linked to the global supply chain and it is understandable given the situation and many trade economies fail to see this risks involved in um, in free trade like the free trade is good but then you also have to take into account these kind of uh, uh, you know low probability high impact events um, so so i think that that recalibration is happening and that can lead to a lot of reshoring of companies from uh, countries like china to other countries and so on and uh, that can probably fuel some part of recovery in these countries uh, the beneficiary beneficiary countries which are getting uh, you know more investment uh, like some of the Southeast Asian countries maybe to some extent India uh, and maybe Pakistan also so I think that is another uh, source of recovery so I think this, I think this combination yeah this combination is what is going to land in the recovery space that's that's fascinating and thank you and that was very in uh, clear and in depth on the same point which you just mentioned uh, on which you ended which is the trade is a rift between US and China um, you clearly pointed out that you know there's an opportunity for countries to benefit out of it. Do you think that there will be another loop? And I'm just this is a question which I'm reading. Do you think there will be another loop that U.S.-China rivalry will lead to lower commodity pricing, and that lower commodity pricing would help developing countries in turn, like we've seen in oil prices? Yeah, actually, it's a very good question. And I have been extensively doing some research on US-China trade tensions, and I have published some papers on that. I'm happy to share. And okay. some of my findings actually corroborate what you just said. 
um, the the tension between US and China lead to maybe two or three different things. First thing is um, uh, prices go down, like you rightly pointed out. Demand demand falls, so prices fall. Uh, yeah, demand for Chinese products in other countries uh, in in US falls, and since US is a big partner for China, the prices fall. So countries, the other countries can you know make use of that. Similarly, the US exports to China uh, is also huge and that is falling. So US demand uh, globally is falling, which means its prices are falling and that is beneficial. The second uh, channel is that um, uh, whatever US was exporting to China and now it is exporting less. So that gap and China um, not necessarily uh, is going to reduce its demand. Like for example, if it is buying um, 100% of its uh, um, corn or maize from US, uh, it's not going to basically, um, you know, stop buying maize at all. Uh, uh, just because it's not buying from US, it has to buy it from somewhere else, and that somewhere else can be one of these countries. So there is what we call a trade diversion effect. So whatever uh, trade that was going from US to China can now happen from maybe India to China or Pakistan to China. And similarly, whatever uh, um, um, uh, trade that was, uh, you know, imports that are happening uh, in the U.S. can now happen um, uh, instead of China, it can come from Pakistan and other countries. So I think that is the silver lining here. Uh, basically, when two people are fighting, the the third persons can benefit out of out of them, right? So they they can get some space in both of them. So that's one thing. And the other thing is also investments. So investments are getting relocated. Um, uh, for example, I don't, I haven't uh, seen it closely, but maybe there could be some Chinese firms coming to Pakistan uh, to avoid the tariffs. So since Pakistan, U.S. tariffs are not, 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 not that bad, uh, so they could, uh, you know, set up their shops uh, in, 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 in Pakistan, and that can lead to a lot of foreign investment in Pakistan. Uh, I don't know how much it is happening, but that is a theoretical possibility. Uh, so I think these are the different, um, you know ways in which uh, this US-China trade tension, and now it is not not anymore US-China, I think it is becoming globe versus China, like Japan is doing it, Korea is doing it, India is doing it, so many, many countries are doing it, so it's not only US now, so so that has, but I, I, I mean, I shouldn't be too optimistic, I mean, all these are possible, but then what if the pie becomes smaller, like if, if the total um, economy itself shrinks, then whatever you're talking about is on the margin. So I just say that, okay, the pie has shrunk and in the shrunk pie, I can get an extra piece. But then if the pie is shrinking, you are still affected. So so definitely, uh, like we all say, nobody, there is no winner in a war. So so this is that kind of a situation. This is kind of a war and there is nobody who is going to gain from it. Uh, no, so absolutely. That's, that's very clear that, you know, the dividends and the gains of globalization on um, on global economy might unwind um, and you're totally right in the short term it can create opportunities but longer term um, it's a win it's a lose-lose perhaps for everybody I have to I really want to go back to an earlier point which you made because I think it's really relevant relevant for Pakistan which is that you said that um, even if countries don't have the physical space to provide the physical stimulus to support their economy it's critical that they use this time to make improve on ease of business and reduce the, you know, move ahead on reforms, uh, which don't cost anything, but it's almost that you have a chance of starting afresh. So, and this can aid the recovery. And I think this is a really important point for a country like Pakistan. So, and I hope, you know, people from uh, the, you know, the power, people responsible for policy in Pakistan, if they listen to this, and I know some of them do, uh, they, they, they take note of that point uh, because yes, we might not have the financial resources provided, but perhaps the impact would be greater if you could just do those reforms and improve the, uh, lower the cost of business. Um, some more questions. So in Pakistan, we've seen uh, the government has identified construction sector as a big uh, area where they want to provide uh, the stimulus in terms of supporting that sector. And I think their argument is that construction has multiple other industries linked with it. So if that goes up, then uh, those industries will also go up. On the counter side, the concern is, of course, how do you get workers to come and work and keep social physical distancing? What's your view on this particular policy? 
So I think it is uh, in normal circumstances, it's a great policy because construct construction, infrastructure, these are the things that uh, that fuel the economy in general. And I think even now also, probably this is a low hanging fruit, something that uh, they can uh, quickly do. But I think I see a few challenges here. One is like what you said, the workers, getting workers to come and practice uh, you know, physical distancing while doing it. And even getting workers, I don't know how the labor's, labor market situation is in Pakistan, but I see that very challenging here in the US. I'm also hearing the same in India. So it's not, uh, not very encouraging. Workers are not, uh, I mean, it's kind of a double whammy. Workers are not earning money and they also don't want to take risk. They don't, they don't want to take risk. They don't want to risk their lives to earn a little income. So, so that's, that's a major uh, thing. And other thing is, I also want to, uh, 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 you know, mention that uh, this physical distancing uh, and other allied uh, aspects that we are looking at now can become relatively more permanent. Uh, a lot of uh, office spaces can become virtual. Um, and many big software companies have already moved in that direction. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and so on. And it can soon trickle down to other uh, you know, companies. Because that's a major transformation that is happening right now. So in this context, I don't know how much uh, construction, particularly commercial construction of you know business complexes and so on, is going to benefit because uh, probably that's going to fall in the future. Uh, and maybe the residential construction is going to be more, more and more because people are going to want, uh, they, they're going to want uh, uh, more space within the home, like some kind of, you know, noise uh, insulation and some new technologies that can and develop home offices and so on. That kind of construction is going to be more. But I think uh, if you're, if you're talking in construction, if you mean the roads and the infrastructure, I think that is, that is a positive thing because that is kind of linked with one of the things that I mentioned, the enabling environment, the business infrastructure kind of environment. In that case, in that context, I think this is a welcome, welcome step. Uh, but I, I also think that it's uh, while it is a good thing and uh, challenges remain, uh, labor and other challenges remain, um, I, I think that this should not be the major measure. There should be other, other measures uh, particularly the costless measures that I mentioned, those are those are the things that are more important. And um, and I have done some research in the past on the returns on investment on infrastructure development, and they are reasonably high. Um, the multiplier effects are more than one. So if you invest X amount in these things, you can you're going to get more than more than X amount in terms of GDP in the medium term. Um, so so in that sense, this is good. Uh, uh, and it's also not just investment; it's also resulting in efficiency enhancement over time. So, depend. So, basically, I'm just assuming these things. I'm assuming that the the construction investment is tied to uh, uh, you know situations where you can improve efficiencies in terms of transportation efficiencies um, and um, and and other benefits. Uh, then I think it can it it has a larger impact because your your going to increase the overall efficiency in the economy and reduce the costs in the medium to uh, long term. So it can have long lasting impact in that sense. So I think depending on the kind of construction projects, I think this can be very profound and positive, but at the, at the same time, uh, there should be other things that also uh, should go on. And since this is mandated by the government, since the government itself is involved directly under its supervision, uh, they can set standards on how to employ the workers how, how can employ employees um, how, how can workers practice uh, you know physical distancing while working closely in these kind of projects so they can it, it's also time to set standards for that which is probably also lacking in I think in every country not only developing countries even the developed countries has have not yet set standards mm -hmm. again mostly this is a bottom-up thing as I mentioned previously that companies have to come up with these solutions but uh, this is an opportunity for the government could uh, set the ball rolling on that. So, so yeah, I think that is my overall view on this. I think this is good, uh, uh, particularly if it is on roads and other infrastructure construction, and and uh, also push, yeah, giving a push to safety standards implementation, and uh, and also um, 
uh, and also i feel that it's not sufficient if if this is the only thing or is a major thing it's not sufficient there should be other other things uh, enabling environments and so on that should also be taken care of thank you that's that's very clear um, two more questions uh, from the audience one is a difficult one and one is a slightly easier one i start with a difficult one more um, we, we we discussed it slightly earlier uh, that you know, the global economy is shrinking as you pointed out in your report as well but the debt of the overall economy is growing and how does that impact does the, does that is that setting us up for a major financial crisis in the future um, will there need to be you know, a rechange or a, 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 a resetting of the covenant, the debt covenants, um, to sustain the global economy? Because otherwise, surely this cannot be sustainable, right? Like with economy shrinking, cash flows declining, and debt ballooning. Have you done any work on that? What's your thoughts on? So basically about the fiscal financial sustainability, right? Financial yes, but debt ballooning globally and the global economy is shrinking. Yeah, um, definitely at the moment, most of my focus has been on the short term implications. The longer term, I'm thinking more conceptually. I have not done any rigorous analysis, but philosophically uh, thinking, I think it's definitely uh, so far in many of the crises that we have had, uh, there have been some countries that were affected and some countries that were not affected so countries could help each other and um, you know uh, so some some debts going from one country to another and so on uh, and this is in, in that sense it's kind of an unprecedented situation or at least in our lifetimes um, which basically uh, uh, lead, has led us led us to a situation where even countries cannot help each other although it's heartening to see that there is some effort in terms of international aid and so on. Some of the developed countries are reaching out, even some developing countries are helping each other. Uh, those things are nice to see, but uh, but I, like you said, eventually this is going to be very difficult. Globally, it's all falling. But I think, uh, I also think that, as I also indicated earlier, the way out of this and um, uh, could, could be that, could be if the limited resources that we have, all the investment and other resources, other resources that we have can be really thought of, well thought, and put in the the sectors or the or the technologies or the the the, the methods, the various methods that can lead to uh, a, a kind of a resilient recovery. So recovery that is not just uh, going back to business as usual as we did before, but basically totally transformed uh, business environment and the economy, as I was telling earlier. Uh, if that can happen, it can probably be a positive thing. Uh, one parallel I can draw is uh, uh, maybe I, I was tempted to talk about the global financial crisis of 2008, but that is nowhere, nowhere near, nowhere as serious as what we are facing now. But uh, I think a better uh, parallel would be the Second World War. The Second World War led to catastrophic global economic and you know, physical impact. But then after that, we had a lot of beautiful institutions that were set up, like United Nations, World Bank, IMF, all this co multilateral cooperation that became the the kind of uh, mantra or the new uh, you know set of uh, positive things that happened, and that resulted in pretty much no major you know world war after that. And and in the same way, I think that. This this uh, kind of this is a tipping point for maybe things like digital transformation and uh, and and basically uh, the notion a lot of people have that uh, all these new technologies are not good for the masses they are going to uh, you know lead to job losses and so on I think that is probably going to change and again uh, two things can happen simultaneously one is because of the uh, uh, all this adoption of new technologies out of compulsion now because now factories are not going to have enough workers so they had to do more automation robotics and uh, so because of this you are on one hand you are going to increase efficiency and reduce cost and in the longer term you are going to be prosperous because of that medium to longer term and another possibility is that the workers who are going to be out of the market they are going to be some of them are going to be absorbed in the new economies that are created. Uh, like, for example, 20 years ago, we didn't know that iPhone would be a big thing. 
um, or we already know even many of us wouldn't have even heard of the word smartphone and now it is basically you know it's just such a huge industry so there could be some unforeseen industries that can come up in the future which can again save us from the financial debacle so basically uh, so that is one. And, and then there is also so so the one part is innovation and uh, innovation that is bottom up and all this technological transformation that was happening gradually and that was expected to happen by 20 30 35 uh, you know that is happening right now today we are seeing that witnessing those changes so that is one side of it maybe positive side and maybe that can lead to some of the you know solutions to what we are what we are discussing second thing is uh, again um, some employees some workers who are either not in the the high skilled uh, you know position where they can be part of all these transformations or even they don't they do not have some niche um, capabilities like for example there will be greater demand for some delicacies some some very special kind of food because people the the high skill people are more prosperous so so somebody who can cook some delicious stuff very specific niche stuff they can they can prosper so if people do not fall under both these categories they are going to be jobless and the situation the things um, the, the policies of uh, you know social protection universal social protection universal universal basic income these have to be uh, put in place and again your question again would be because the fundamental question you asked was what 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 about financial sustainability globally uh, and this this is uh, again a negative part of that because the other aspects are probably going to contribute to uh, greater sustainability but this is people uh, income less and jobless is going to be a big bother and unless uh, some financial mechanisms are also done there some kind of redistribution of course uh, you cannot expect everything from the government but basically uh, basically you can have rules like if somebody is shedding uh, employment uh, there, there should be some minimum uh, like some kind of severance packages should be you know uh, given and so on so i think that is where i see that the world can make use of the situation what we are facing now to avoid further financial catastrophe uh, because if you just do normal recovery you just put in more money put in more money and encourage people to do things they already like to do already have been doing and then it may just lead to problems i think we should learn from how world bank and imf have been functioning with countries the same way the government should function with the industries so like the way government when world bank gives you a loan it tells you what to do um if you don't follow that they they are going to cut the loans or not not agree to give you a loan the same way the government in the stimulus packages can mandate the firms to uh, follow certain things which can lead to sustainable recovery because unfortunately uh, many of the industries are short sighted they think about immediate losses immediate profits and so on uh, but the stimulus should be more keeping keeping the long term uh, uh, impact in mind and they have to come up with some conditions when they provide these loans and stimulus packages so that the this bottom up recovery is kind of triggered uh, by the government so so i think that is what that's kind of a complicated you know thought process that they have i don't know whether i communicated effectively but uh, you certainly but have uh, i think you in fact not only that you have also anticipated some of the questions which were coming while before you uh, even started answering so i'll just add some of those i'll just combine some of those questions but you have already answered some of them is that you know from your answer it seems that there is a massive dislocation both at the national level where there is debt and you know there some countries cannot afford that and even at the company and a micro level and they need and this dislocation cannot resolve itself automatically left on the market forces if we continue to do what we did in the past and if we continue to follow the rules which we were following in the past this is not sustainable on both sides right and unemployment on the micro level unemployment wage destruction loss of job move to automation and similarly at the macro level global level high debt and um, uh, unsustainable level of debt and the example you gave is very apt which is world war 2 post that almost a new social contract was defined and these multinational institutions were set up to 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 support different countries and redistribute wealth um either through the marshall plan or through these organization but the complication at this time is that instead of that what we see is that there's a bifurcation uh, there's a rather there's a move towards nationalism 
Um, and of course, these trends existed even prior to the crisis, but they seem to be have um, been amplified. So, so this makes it kind of difficult, right? That you need global you need global coordination to solve the problem, but instead we have seen an inward movement, which kind of risks um, or amplifies the risk of another meltdown, if not even bigger. Um, on, uh, and I think that's a, that's a difficult question to like, you know, really answer or discuss. And we only have questions on that. So I'll move to an easier question. I'm conscious of time. We, we have 10 more minutes. We have gone over the 40 minutes, which I requested you. But an easier question, you know, you're based in Seattle, um, which is a tech capital um, along with Silicon Valley, um, with you know, Amazon and Microsoft and eBay of the world. But how do you see the tech sector performing? Do you see post-COVID um, um, a greater shift towards digitalization? Um, and what's happening around you? I and mean, do you see the impact of that in the city you're living in? Yeah, it has been uh, really uh, positive, I would say, because I see that most of our um, uh, my neighbors and friends who work in Microsoft, Google, um, Amazon, and all these companies, they are only recruiting more and more people, and they are overworked. They are stressed out uh, because they like all this Zoom and other things that we're using, like Microsoft Teams, um, you know, Google Hangout. All all these things are used so much. So that you know they they are they are completely swamped and busy, uh, and 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 the, the that that part of the economy is definitely expanding rapidly, um, and also companies like Amazon, e-commerce companies are also like you know I've not I haven't been out for two and a half months, literally. Uh, maybe I've just stepped out for a short walk for five minutes, but nothing more than that. So all the groceries that we are purchasing, including our South Asian groceries, everything has been online. And uh, Amazon has been a major player there. And there are, and more interestingly, uh, the big players, we all know, I think it's a known fact, but there are many small players that are coming up. Small, like for example, I was giving you this example of South Asian groceries. Uh, you know, Amazon Prime does most of it, but there are certain things that doesn't, like some types of vegetables that we eat, uh, they're not available on Amazon, so particularly for, for fresh uh, vegetables kind of stuff, Amazon is not great. So for that, we have a separate a new startup that was started up just a few months ago that has become very prominent now. Um, like there are things like that that are happening. And also this uh, like immediate solutions to COVID recovery, like uh, contact tracing kind of apps. Uh, there have been startups that are focusing on this. Um, so, so definitely, you know, digital technologies, like I told, like you rightly asked about uh, this part of the world, uh, I can see that, uh, happening, uh, nobody's talking about layoff. Nobody's talking about, um, you know, they're only talking about hiring more people. They want more and more people, not only the tech people, not only the high skill people in the case of you know, Microsoft and so on, but also the delivery boys. You need people who are to deliver stuff, right? In Amazon, you can order, but who has to, somebody has to deliver it. So that they have been huge. Um, on one side, you see the huge unemployment increasing all time high unemployment. But on the other side, there are these new opportunities that are coming up. And there is probably like, uh, always I, when I look at labor market any, in any part of the world, I always see this problem. There is a simultaneous lack of supply and lack of demand because of the exact nature, like supply and demand should, the nature should be exactly the same that is missing. But I, I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty positive on the digital economy part of it. Uh, so I think that answers this question. But I also wanted to very, very briefly touch upon the last issue, that the more difficult thing that you mentioned. Um, I think the, the the thing, the rise of protectionism, rise of nationalism. Uh, I think uh, we should not totally uh, ignore uh, some of the valid points that that camp raises. We may not be part of that camp, but we should also consider um, some valid questions. I mean, the very reason why protectionism became so rampant in UK and US was because the, the free trade policies, free market policies went to the other extreme of not compensating the people who are losing. Like, for example, Canada has is a success story because they did NAFTA and after NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, they made sure that the workers who are displaced were retrained and retained in the new sectors that are booming, the services sectors and so on. Whereas in the US, uh, in the 90s, that wasn't done so well and that, that uh, people were really depressed and worried for that. And that's why we got the previous 
Republican government. The Bush government came partly because of that. And uh, it, it was a swing again. Now, now there is a very, it's not, um, people may question the, um, the, the exact way of operating or, uh, you know, talking of the, the administration, Trump administration and so on. But there are many people who concur with some of these views. Many even educated, enlightened people they agree. The reason is that there are uh, risks involved in the global supply chains and those risks have to be acknowledged and certain measures have to be taken to uh, some kind of uh, reducing, uh, basically evening the dependence on uh, countries. So for example, we, most of the countries are so dependent on China. So if something happens in China, then all of us are affected. So this is purely from a technical point of view, not from any ideological point of view. It's, it's actually important to have some plans, some kind of risk mitigation plans and so on. And we all say as free trade economists, we say that trade actually mitigates risk because you will reduce your dependence, complete dependence on the domestic market and you're more outward. But then that mitigation can happen only if that is more even, if you're depending on multiple uh, countries simultaneously. If one country goes wrong, it can move to other countries. Uh, I think that kind of calibration is happening now. So I would say some part of protectionism is bad. Uh, it should not be there. But another, another part of it is basically recalibrating global supply chains, basically recalibrating and reinventing global supply chains. And maybe that is something we cannot avoid. That is happening through the market forces, not necessarily, not only by the government. Uh, although the, the people at the helm of affairs, they are, they look very, um, you know, comical and, uh, you know, the, the way they're talking doesn't make sense. Uh, but the underlying principles are pretty solid and, and they are coming from market forces and people at large. So I think that, uh, thank that's, you. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Actually, um, that um, that there's a genuine case as well, and that's why, of course, we cannot just brush it under the carpet um, um, just on basis on how it's presented to us. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe we can end with this final question. Um, this concept of uh, it's a question that you know JP, Jamie Diamond of J.P. Morgan said that this is a wake up call, and we must build a fairer society. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the points which you mentioned is about that point, about fairness, you know, whether right. it's on a micro level or at the macro level uh, or on the industry level, you know, the examples which you gave. Uh, so would you agree that, um, that you know, there needs to be a move, a recognition of that and there needs to be a move towards that because if it doesn't happen, then even this, this trend of automation and this trend towards digitalization might even create a more unfair society uh, because you know many parts of the world who don't have internet, uh, many parts of the world who don't have access to digital technologies, who might not know the language, um, um, might be left out of this. So there needs to be almost a rethink of the social contract uh, to make it more fairer. Um, would you agree with that? And secondly, lastly, do you see any move towards that in the US? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, that is a way to go because fairness is not anymore uh, like just uh, compassion related things that, you know, we are we're well off, we help, help the poor, that kind of thing. But it is more like um, a necessary thing. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's important. It, 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 it's important for the business, actually. For, for business, it is it is important. So um, so I think that that has to be done by all players, uh, you know, the industries, people at large. Uh, the government, everyone. So you cannot just keep the, you know, blame or responsibility on the government alone. Uh, I completely agree on that. And in terms of uh, moving towards that direction, um, I think globally we are making some progress uh, at the moment with all these packages and so on. In the U.S. also, uh, the 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 package has been mainly on cash transfers to. Uh, the poorer people and uh, SMEs, the small, small and medium businesses, in addition to the usual um, uh, bailouts of the bigger, bigger companies and so on. So I think um, the um, uh, it, it is it is uh, going in the right direction, uh, but I think I don't know whether uh, like if because in the short term anyway there is no other way, no other option. We have to do it. But I want to just understand whether it is happening as a long-term thing and how, how, how are these things going to sustain over time? Mm -hmm. Like you said, if you have massive automation and so on, 
as i also mentioned there could be some new industries to absorb the people who are getting laid off but there could also still be certain types of people who don't fit into either, any of those camps like either um, you know highly skilled or uh, you know a niche uh, you know blue collar kind of skills uh, they are going to be jobless and there has to be some kind of protection for them social protection and uh, the, the, those kind of things should be there so i think uh, that that has to be taken care of by the government in collaboration with the industries and people so i think that is how it it has to go forward and i think at least uh, one, one thing i can say is that uh, it needs a lot of thought so a mm -hmm. uh, lo lot of uh, collaboration we have to sit together discuss and so on i'm also happy to say that i'm currently collaborating with an alliance in pakistan uh, working on coming up with the new social protection norms so the alliance of economists we are working together to come up with some ideas for uh, you know social protection and submit something to the government so i'm also helping helping that um, and and doing similar things in other countries too so i think that is like i think we as like we're all uh, people who are in investors who are economists who are you know think who have some thoughts and uh, knowledge in in these expertise in these things so we have to devote our time you know um, volunteer our time to think about the society at large partly because it is our duty and you know for the country for the society and so on but also because it is going to make business sense for us mm -hmm. so eventually so i think that part is missing people think of this as philanthropy but it's actually it also makes business sense so thank you for that padri this was very very uh, insightful interesting and philosophical so thank you for your time and you know I, i'll end with your quoting your your point that um fairness is not just a do good thing it's not just about philanthropy it's now a business requirement so it's a it's a very uh, very much uh, rational uh, thing which needs to be in a in a model uh, when we are making um, financial decisions um uh, thank you for your time this was extremely okay. insightful and your your webinar will be available on ksb's website ksb.blog also people who want to uh, we will be making a summary of it and distributing it the people who want to subscribe to that they can download ksb k trade app uh, ktrade.pk get on the mailing list and get access to uh, the summary of this report um and it will also be on linkedin and facebook um, thank, thank you. you for your time badri have a good day thank you. Yeah thank you so much Ali and uh, thank you everyone have a have a great great evening bye thank you bye bye bye, bye.